first meeting of the quarter. So um, we have a full week this week, uh, getting into interpersonal communication at work, and then also getting into the dark side and negative parts of communication. Um, I was talking to another professor, and I was like, you know, it's kind of sad that we're ending, like, dark side. And he goes, you know, just call it defense against the dark arts. So we'll start the week with work, and we'll end with defense against the dark arts. That's great. Uh, so uh, I also want to thank you for making it today. I mentioned this through an announcement earlier, but I know that the weather has been pretty treacherous uh, this morning, waking up to the snow. The uh, thing I want to emphasize is that um, I'll follow kind of EOU's guidelines about uh, closure and so on, right? So they have a hotline, you call the number, and it's a voice that tells you if there's any cancellations. You should also get that information through email if it comes up. However, uh, especially if you're commuting, uh, and you feel like it's not safe to come up to campus any time this week, that's okay, right? That would count for me as an excused absence, and you're welcome to complete the makeup assignment uh, if you need to do that. So please, if you're not feeling safe or you're hurting yourself to come here, please don't do that and do what you need for yourself. Um, it's interesting to see some of the snow here, right? So I lived in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah for five years where there was a ton of snow, uh, but there were also a ton of trucks and salting the roads and all that in a pretty big city. So not as much snow, but also uh, a lot smaller, so there's not enough, as much infrastructure here for that. So I'm getting used to uh, taking turns slowly going up to campus. So that's kind of fun. So, um, as I mentioned, right, today we'll be looking at interpersonal communication at work. Um, I think this is kind of a helpful way of thinking about, like, uh, professional opportunities, internships, jobs that you might already be a part of, uh, volunteer work, and that type of thing. And if you find that for your essay, right, you're using something with a coworker or somebody that you're involved with through work, um, that can be a really good applied thing to do. Uh, one kind of exciting thing here at EOU is we're actually starting uh, and we're looking for uh, a new hire, hopefully in the area of public relations with the hope that they can actually start a public relations uh, group on campus. So there's some exciting developments in using and applying some of the things that we are talking about for today. Um, as a reminder, extra credit is due on Friday. Uh, you get 20 points, 2% added on for doing that. Just make sure to get it in by Friday. So I uh, won't accept that one late. 10 to 12 on December 15th. We don't have a formal cumulative final exam, but I am asking you to come to class to share um, your progress toward your final essay. It doesn't need to be a big, fancy, rehearsed presentation with slides. It can just be a conversation. Now, what you have, some of the things that you're still needing to work on and develop as you're getting up for your final project. Yes? So for the essay portion of it, are we like doing like an interpersonal analysis of it, like what we did with the shows that we watched? Yeah, so it looks pretty similar to your first essay in terms of taking ideas from the course, using some quotes and applications um, from your conversation. Uh, but the thing I'm asking you to focus on are terms and concepts from the back half of the course. Okay. So I included in a recent Canvas announcement a kind of long list of some of the ideas that we've been going over in the class since the exam. Things about like different strategies of relationships, ways they come together and fall apart. Um, you know, romantic relationships, family, friends, those types of things that should have some relevance to who you're choosing for your conversation. And then as far as the conversation topic, that's like FX, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, some people have talked about it as an interview, but, um, you know, your communication in that process matters too. So you might have some questions or initial thoughts, but you want to open it up into you sharing and disclosing and not just asking questions the whole time. Yeah. Um, also, again, to help out with that, last Friday I posted um, that there is both an example outline, right, which goes over the major details um, and structure that you could use for the assignment, and then an example of like transcribing. Um, so remember that the um, transcription does not count toward the four pages. And then um, essay will be due on December 16th. Let me know if something's come up and you're not able to get that in on time, like an emergency where you're falling behind. Um, my goal is to try to grade and get you your final grades submitted as quickly as I can. So um, kind of knowing where people are at with remaining assignments helps uh, to get that done. 
And then um, you can also complete any makeup assignments that you need to catch up on between now and the end of the quarter. Uh, the other thing I wanted to remind you about, uh, again, if you haven't done so already, uh, please complete the instructor course evaluations. You should have received an email on Canvas on doing those. Again, those are super helpful for me to know what went well and what I can do to adjust for future courses. Uh, so please do that if you haven't done so already. So last class, I know that uh, a lot of folks weren't able to make it last Friday. Uh, so last class, we spent some time going over the discussion leading. Now that everybody has grades on those assignments, um, I wanted to share some general thoughts about uh, ways to continue working on public speaking and presentation and situations like this one. Um, you know, you work great on formal public speaking, but I know you have to do for some classes, group presentations, so I wanted to give a little bit of pointers there. We talked a little bit about family communication challenges, specifically some of the ways that things like sibling rivalry and relationships between siblings are challenging. So if you're choosing a sibling for your uh, recording and reflection essay, you might use some of those ideas about different models of sibling relationships. And also uh, couples, right, marriage and spousal relationships, some of the shortcomings and limitations that the text might have in describing those and so on, and some of the ways that communication can play out differently with family members. So last week's work is great if you're choosing a family member for your conversation, and some of these ideas that we talked about last week will help a lot. So for this class, we kind of have a contained discussion on interpersonal communication in the workplace. Again, I think this is kind of helpful, like practical stuff. Um, everything from making an email um, to a professor to, um, you know, working on an internship, doing coaching, doing mentoring, um, and all sorts of other kind of professional applications too. So, um, you know, and I think a lot of the things that you read for today on interpersonal communication are really focused on a lot of face-to-face -face interactions, right? And one thing that we know um, and that we felt, especially over this last year and a half, is that the way that we use the workplace to communicate um, has changed a lot, right? Uh, the very landscape of where we're working, how do we choose to work, um, and what work looks like in the future looks really, really different. And again, um, just to share again that the uh, 15 to 20 minute uh, conversation, a uh, transcript, um, up four pages, transcription. Please make sure you're including the in text and work cited from Jan or from uh, the wrench textbook. So um, this chart here has a model of uh, as of 2017, uh, basically how much of our lives we might spend working for like the average adult in the United States, right? And I think what's interesting are some of the ways that this has changed a lot over time. So like the average day, it's estimated that you know, about nine hours or so, right about here, uh, is related to work. And um, you know, things like sleeping and care over here, uh, leisure activities and so on are here. And then kind of these things would be more about household activities, care, and so on, right? So on average, already, the work that we do is a pretty huge part of our lives, or will be as we go forward. You might think about, you know, being a student now, I mean, a lot of what you do is work in its own way, right? Uh, but over COVID, I think one of the challenges that's come up is that while we would think, right, in a vacuum, that um, we would have less work or work-related activities on average, one thing that's actually happened is that uh, the kind of ratio of our work has gotten bigger, right? Um, one of the big reasons why is as work has shifted to remote, it's gotten a lot blurrier. If you're working in the same place that you're doing things like sleep and personal care and leisure and all of that, it's much, much easier for work to bleed into those things. Um, so one thing a lot of people have expressed when they've talked about mental health challenges, stress, uh, feeling overstretched is the idea that they can't compartmentalize as well, right? So I lived in a tiny third floor apartment when COVID was getting bad. And, you know, taking meetings, hosting classes um, in this little space uh, was weird. And uh, finding ways to balance out a separate space to work uh, was really challenging. So one thing that a lot of us have felt is some of the changes in 
the amount that we're working as things like answering emails, uh, doing work outside of normal hours, and so on, have developed, and also you know, what the role of location and space has in work, too. Obviously, there is a lot of jobs, including essential work, um, that has remained and needed to remain face-to-face. -face. But I think a lot of the dynamics have shifted, and so it's important for us to think about how our communication in the workplace, or even what a workplace is, is super, super different. So there's a lot of different ways that these changes have happened, and I think are ways that we can think about some of the ideas presented in the text for today in a little bit more of a complicated light. Again, one of those things is remote work, right? So one thing to think about is, while we don't necessarily know where COVID-19 is heading, right? Um, I think a lot of uh, people who publish news outlets or um, speculate should probably be fired because things did not go the way that we expected them to, right? And speculation does not get us very far. Um, I remember back when we were in flattening the curve, and this will be over in six weeks. Um, so we might not know when COVID will be over, very hot, but we do know that the changes that we've seen to work are going to persist even after COVID is gone, right? Uh, that we see a lot of differences and a much bigger emphasis on remote work. Uh, there have been a lot of employers and folks that have realized, hey, ever since we moved this office meeting to Zoom, like, why do we need to have it face-to-face -face anymore? We can just do it through Zoom. It's a lot easier for everybody. We're not going to switch back. Or a lot of people have found uh, that their work is being offered remotely uh, basically longer into the future, that they're not going to go back to the office, or that certain jobs um, are now being offered and promoted remotely um, in terms of things like logistics and travel, visiting family, um, as well as issues related to um, the workplace and um, being able to do things like childcare, right? So a lot of reasons why, on average, coming out of COVID, we will see a lot more remote work in general. One of the consequences of that, right, is that figuring out good communication through using things like Zoom, Google Hangouts, um, and using email is really, really important uh, because, as we've been talking about throughout the class, right, so much of our communication is verbal, uh, up to 93%, and nonverbal communication is how we make sense of a lot of cues and context. If it's just text or if it's just a Zoom background, oftentimes there's a lot more ambiguity, uncertainty, and challenges in how we communicate with each other. Um, so there's also less of kind of a casual space, right? So um, oftentimes in a workspace, uh, there would be some pretty active, casual conversation, getting lunch with somebody and so on, but we're not seeing that in the same way if people are working remotely or are a lot more limited in how they uh, interact face-to-face. -face. Also, right, one of the challenges, and one that you might have felt as a student who might have used something like Zoom for uh, your classes in the past, is the like exposure you feel to personal lives. We have things like backgrounds and filters and so on to help with this, but uh, there was something weird and kind of invasive about feeling like you were broadcasting part of your world for other people to see, right? Um, Again, we had a tiny apartment, we had a cat who really loved to go across the camera right in the middle of class. And there were little things like that, where it was this window into your life that was, you know, not something you were always comfortable sharing. So there's communication ambiguity since we switch to a lot of online forms, uh, but also a lot more flexibility in terms of flexible hours, um, you know, more opportunities to reach out to and develop your own schedule. and um, also, you know, some challenges and disparities in the type of work that might be available remote versus face-to-face. -face. Again, there's a lot of work that no matter what would have to happen face-to-face, -face, you know, including a lot of essential work, healthcare workers, uh, individuals that would be involved in things like infrastructure, um, and, you know, a lot of physical labor type of jobs. But there's still a lot of changes in how we engage in communication as it relates to work. So. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, last class, some of the ideas and concepts from the book are helpful as starting points, but I challenge us to continue to think critically about them. Uh, that you know, no term or idea is neutral. Uh, for instance, 
right? The concept of professionalism um, is a term that, yeah, it has some good and useful applications for us to be good communicators, but the history of what it means to be a professional or who gets to be under the definition of professionalism is really challenging. I'll give you an example. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, passed in 1990, and it was designed to provide reasonable accommodation and support for folks with disabilities. On paper, that sounds like a way that folks with disabilities could feel involved professionally, and that professionalism could be more inclusive. However, if you have ever applied to a job, uh, or an internship, or anything, and you've noticed in the job description that it says that a required responsibility is to be able to lift up to 30 pounds of weight, you might be confused because for a lot of jobs, there would be no situation in which you would be lifting a 30 pound box. The reason that that clause exists is because businesses have used that as a loophole to prevent folks with disabilities in many situations from being qualified, right? ADA provides reasonable accommodation, but listing this 30 pound requirement uh, structurally uh, prohibits a lot of people with disabilities from qualifying for the job, right? So professionalism is not neutral, and there's still a lot of challenges and exclusion related to that as well, right? I think, too, about some of the ways that policies in the past, including in professionalism in the workplace, right, have a history of issues surrounding racism as well, right? The regulation of what would be considered, quote, acceptable hairstyles uh, to have at the office Right, would be rooted in things like racial discrimination. Um, and um, you might think about the roles of gender as well. So for instance, uh, what does it mean to be considered professional in clothing and mannerism and behavior? Right? Uh, that definition isn't neutral. So ideally, professionalism is designed to be inclusive and designed to be supportive. And I think that the best way to describe that is that it depends on the context of the situation. So, if we think about like a profession as a job or career that is important and that matters to you and to your life, professionalism is this idea that context matters. The situation and the circumstances in which you communicate with other people that's respectful, that's supportive, and so on, um, play a really big part in that, right? For instance, there might be ways to show professionalism through the use of email. And I'm pretty casual when it comes to email. I don't have like a whole lot of hey, you didn't include a signature, I'm not reading this message, that's ridiculous. But, um, you know, a general practice, I think that helps a lot if you have to do more professional email, is clear subject line that ties to your topic, right? Um, starting with an intro clause where you might include somebody's name or title, you might include somebody's name. Um, more generally, you have kind of an introduction. Um, I hope this message finds you well, something like that. You present content clearly, such as using a question. Um, you might wrap up and show your support, like I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, you would include kind of an ending clause, like thanks or best, uh, and then some signature. If you use Google Mail, right, there is the signature that auto-generates that you can create so that you can easily use that every single time. Um, again, those are general things that we've talked about as examples of professionalism that might apply to uh, sending something like an email. So if you've seen The Office, right, you know that there's a lot of patterns of unethical communication in that show. That's a pretty big source of humor. Um, I'm a pretty big fan of the show Parks and Rec, and there's a lot of examples of unethical and unprofessional behavior there, too. Um, you can think about unethical communication in the workplace as um, exploitation, deception, uh, and otherwise trying to negatively impact relationships that might happen in the workplace. So I have a funny little clip from Parks and Rec that I think is an example of some of the ways that unethical behavior can happen in the workplace. Who broke it? I'm not mad, I just want to know. I did. I no, know. no you didn't. Tom? Don't look at me. Look at Ben. What? I didn't break it. Huh, that's weird. How'd you even know it was broken? Because it's sitting right in front of us and it's broken. 
suspicious. No, it's not. If it matters. I mean, now, but April was the last one. Oh, Why? I don't even drink that crap. Oh, really? Then what were you doing by the coffee cart earlier? I used the wooden star to put it back on cuticles. Everyone knows that. Okay, Jerry. Okay, let's not fight. I'm broken. Let me pay for it, Ron. No. Who broke it? Ron. Don has been on for quite a while. Really? Yeah, really. Oh, oh my God. Say, no, I'm, I'm, broken. Broken. I'm broken. I burned my hand, so I punched it. I predict ten minutes from now they'll be at each other's throats with war paint on their faces and a pig head on a stick. So, kind of a funny example, right, of uh, unethical communication at work, right? So, uh, Ron, as you might know if you've seen the show, um, actively hates and tries to dismantle his own job. Uh, doesn't believe in the parks department. Um, so, we see a lot of examples of unethical communication. Uh, it's deceptive, he is trying to mislead and get people arguing with each other when he's the one that broke it, right? Um, there's coercion at play, trying to manipulate or create an argument between members of the group. Um, it's destructive, again, designed to hurt and ultimately uh, lead to a lot of disagreement. So there's also, right, communication that's intrusive. So for instance, um, one of the challenges, if you think about yourself in your own, um, capacity, if you're working as a leader or a mentor, right, is respecting boundaries of communication in the workplace. For instance, ensuring that you don't let, um, you don't contact people at times that are inappropriate or don't make sense. So, like, um, you know, if you're a boss, don't contact somebody at 11 p.m. on a Saturday unless that's within the time period that you'd be working. Uh, secretive communication is where you're hiding information. So one really major example of secretive communication in the workplace um, that we've seen increased attention to over the last few years uh, have been celebrities, including actors, and the ways that um, folks are paid. So um, one kind of common practice that a lot of employers or supervisors might use is to discourage employees from openly talking about or sharing how much they get paid. Uh, so there have been examples in recent years, right, where that practice was used on the set for films, um, and women would later discover that they were not paid as much as male co-stars, right? So secretive communication can be a big problem when it comes to things like pay, wages, and so on. Um, and secretive communication can be designed to hide some of those elements. And then exploitative, right, is designed to expose, to hurt, to out somebody. Again, if you've seen The Office, there's a lot of examples of this kind of inappropriate um, sharing personal details about somebody that are not meant to be shared, right? So, for instance, um, through FERPA, um, it's a regulation that prohibits sharing personal information, including medical information, um, in grades and so on, um, to um, people outside of education, uh, or, you know, preventing that information from being confidential. So that gets at the role of ethics, right, of being just of being supportive um, and you know whether you're in a more position of power as an employer or you're working um, with other people these are challenges to try to continue to deal with so uh, one of the biggest examples of some of the ways that culture and culturally related challenges emerge including in professional settings is the idea of a microaggression how many folks have heard this term used before yeah, so a few of you. So microaggression, one of the best ways to think about this idea is death by a thousand cuts, right? So if you think about like an insult or a phrase or a comment that's said about somebody and is insulting, um, you might think to yourself, you know what, uh, that's just what is, right? Um, if somebody says something that's hurtful or mean or whatever, it's not a big deal. The problem, right, is that because those types of comments are so frequent, they accumulate over time in a way that can become disproportionately hurtful and draining, right? So one example here, right, is nurse, can you find me a doctor, which has a gendered assumption that because somebody is a woman, they must not be a doctor, right? That's an example of a microaggression at play, is that because of somebody's identity, such as a gender or group or so on, that they wouldn't be qualified or wouldn't have that role. Do you speak English, right? Address toward folks that aren't white, 
Another example of microaggression, right, is suggesting that on the basis of race that somebody uh, does not speak English. If there are any doctors from America here, right, would be an example of using things like ethnocentrism. So a lot of examples, including um, in situations like uh, medical context where that can be an issue too. I want to show a short clip that talks about the issue of microaggressions in a little bit more detail um, and some of the impacts that microaggressions can have on people. See for little. You did really well in the skills check off today. I was pleasantly surprised. Since I was a kid, I've always known I've wanted to do this. Consider a time you've witnessed an interaction that left you feeling uncomfortable because it implied that someone or a group wasn't capable or expected to be successful. This interaction is called a microaggression. Microaggression is a term used to describe remarks or actions that imply negative associations and insults toward an individual or group. These are often directed at members of historically marginalized groups. People are often unaware that the impact of their words and actions can have such harmful consequences. This video is part one of a two-part series designed to empower you to notice and interrupt microaggressions. Every microaggression students and staff experience adds to their load. One unintentional comment may seem insignificant, but these comments and experiences can get very heavy. Like, so, um, right, this is kind of the example of like rocks piling up on people's backs and so on is another way of thinking about microaggressions. So um, I just started watching, there's a new docu-series on Netflix um, that's uh, Colton Underwood, who is the former bachelor uh, who recently came out as gay, right? And as an example of this idea, he, um, one of the kind of most emotionally challenging experiences for him was that from his coaches um, and people growing up playing football, he would feel like they would make a lot of kind of homophobic jokes or insults, right? And so one of the ways that microaggressions play out in particular is they impact folks when they come from positions of power, right? So uh, that can be challenging if a supervisor is using like slurs or insults and so on, uh, because from that position of power, there's a lot more credibility, and there's a lot more challenge in speaking out or thinking uh, about how to respond to that. Issues of bias, right, are an important consideration as well. So um, where are you speaking from? Um, again, we kind of identified some of the issues of both racist and sexist language that might carry some kind of charged connotations there. And again, ethnocentrism gets at the belief that somebody's own culture is better than another's, um, which is an important thing to break away from. So some of the ways that um, strategies can be used to combat that. Um, first of all, right, biases exist. Um, as much as we try, right, we will still feel some level of bias in what we do every single day. Um, remain open and empathic, right? Think back to the idea of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, uh, particularly in something like the workplace where you're dealing with people that come from unique uh, backgrounds or might be new and trying to adjust to some of the unwritten rules and challenges. Curiosity, right? And openness to understand and engage in perspectives that you might not be used to is important. Um, the idea of letting go and urge to fix every problem is an important idea too, right? Uh, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about relationship styles and some of the ways that conflict might come up in relationships, but not every relationship necessarily, um, not every time do people in a relationship want there to be an easy, quick fix to the issue, right? Sometimes there needs to be a space for venting or sharing or understanding uh, the emotional challenges or issues people are going through rather than rushing to a solution right away, right? So taking the time to understand and empathize is an important way to eventually get to a more constructive place. And then things like collaboration matter a lot too, right? So we think about how in uh, more work and professional spaces, the use of engagement among multiple people uh, can be a really good way to solve some of these problems. You can also think about the error method, which is another way of kind of breaking down and understanding this a little bit better. 
So you start with empathy, again, putting yourself in somebody else's perspective, taking responsibility, right? Responsibility means essentially owning up for uh, the ways that you could have improved or fixed your behavior, giving a reason or providing support uh, for the thing that you said. Um, so reason kind of gets at the role of excuses. And, uh, you know, an excuse might be that I'm, I was a little bit ignorant at the time about this, and I've gotten better about using this idea or term. Uh, and then providing reassurance, right? And uh, providing some type of guarantee that something like that won't happen again. Um, in my conflict management class, we've been talking about the way to create a good apology. A good apology is saying, you know, I'm sorry, uh, you acknowledge what you did, um, take responsibility for it, and then you try to develop some type of path forward through things like reconciliation. We think about situations where that has not gone so well. Uh, one example that immediately comes to mind, right, has been um, everything surrounding Travis Scott and the performances, right, where uh, folks died through suffocation. There have been a lot of challenges in the ways that he's responded to and addressed that controversy. So, um, you know, we can kind of think about those stages in that example, too. So um, one other thing that I think is helpful for us to think about, before I give you your own prompt to apply some of these ideas a little bit more, are some of the ways that uh, the types of communication among employers, employees, or you can think about it as the communication you've had with somebody like a coach or mentor, right, uh, might fit under one of these four different strategies of communication. And this is measured both in terms of how much the leader supervisor or organizer is guiding the process, and then how much the leader is providing certain forms of support and assurance toward people, right? So um, kind of up here, the top left, we have a situation where the leader provides a lot of support, but not a lot of direction. So a, a supportive role might be something like, hey, um, I'm here if you need me. I'm available to help you out. Um, you know, I'll be here to answer your questions. So they make themselves available, but they're not really guiding a whole lot on the discussion. This is an especially common model if you are already adjusted to and have a good deal of trust with the group. So for instance, uh, the supporting model might be used if you're working and, you know, you're something like a team captain, right, where you're able to um, take on a lot on your own. The coaching approach the top right is the idea that the leader provides a lot of direction and the leader provides a lot of support, right? So they tell you the practices you need to do as part of your coaching for the day, uh, but they're also there to constructively guide you and help you out as you're dealing with those challenges that might come up. The delegating approach means that there's neither a whole lot of support nor direction. So you could think about delegating as kind of divvying up or directing something towards somebody else. That might be something like, hey, um, you need to be prepared for competition, go do it. And then something like a directing role uh, would mean that they don't provide a whole lot of support, but uh, they do make their guidelines clear. So here's what you need to do. Here's a list of the ways you need to prepare for your competition, uh, go do it. So these different models help us to think about how communication, particularly with like a supervisor or leader, could change over time. There's also the idea of like a leader-manager exchange theory, right, where people are working with and creating good relationships. So again, if there's something you, somebody you know through like a work or professional capacity, uh, this model can be helpful too. Uh, but the way to think about this model is that the stage that you have with somebody you work with goes from being a total stranger to a really close partner, the person that you're working with, right? Early on, you're creating this relationship. Uh, you know, your roles are very defined. There's not a lot of trust. And generally speaking, it's more about fulfilling your self-interest. We can think back to uncertainty reduction theory that we talked about in the class, right? That's an approach that suggests that the more that we get to know and feel comfortable with somebody, the less reciprocal our relationships are, right? When we are first getting to know somebody, we're very tit for tat, we're very, how are you? Well, I'm good, how are you? And it can feel kind of weird. If you're really good friends and get along really well, there's 
more focus on kind of asymmetrical relationships. It's more okay to have one day where one person is doing most of the talking or venting. So, um, as relationships develop in more professional settings, right, there's a lot more focus on building trust, on communication that and roles that are a little bit more flexible. And when you get to the idea of a partner, that means you're somebody that's open to sharing your total thoughts and ideas about an issue. There's a lot of disclosure and trust, and you feel like your opinion is valued in a way that you might not otherwise experience. So, kind of the last major model that I want to hit on is that as somebody, you know, who might be a member of a team on campus, who might be a mentee, a mentorship relationship, right, or somebody that's involved in an internship or job, the different styles of following along um, can be really different. And those are based on the level of support that you might have from a supervisor or coach, um, and also the level of challenge that you provide to that supervisor. So challenge is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Pushing back or expressing your own opinion um, can be constructive in the right situation. So under an individualist approach, um, basically there's not a whole lot of support that a supervisor gives, but you're able to directly challenge and go about your own path. We've seen this a lot with remote work, right, where a lot of times you're able to build in your own schedule, and individualists tend to focus on their own solution to the problem that might not be what uh, their supervisor says they should do, but nevertheless is able to get the problem solved. A partner, like I mentioned before, is the idea that somebody openly expresses their opinion, but also has a lot of support, that you are uh, an open party, that your opinion feels valued and heard them. If you've ever heard somebody describe themselves as a resource, right? So uh, there's this resource that's available for you on campus, right? Resource doesn't provide a lot of support, but not a lot of challenge either. It's making yourself available um, and essentially saying, hey, I'll do this work, I'll provide this service for you. Um, but, you know, that's largely on you. And then an implementer is somebody who is able to work closely with the supervisor to provide the direct kind of applied forms of uh, support and putting those ideas and thoughts into action. So here's what we need to work on together. Uh, let's work as a team and develop a solution to the problem. Might be an approach that this person takes. So what I'd like you to do now is, given some of the ideas that we've been talking about so far uh, related to developing uh, good, effective communication, I want you to think about a career field that maybe you're in already through something like, you know, work access class, um, an internship, or something that you have some level of engagement with already, or something you're potentially interested in for the future. It doesn't have to be something you're locked into, but maybe you say, you know what, I'm really interested in a career in sports medicine, or I'm really interested in a career in journalism. So pick something that maybe stands out to you as a possibility. And what I'd like you to think about is, given the way that we've talked about it so far, what does it mean to be a professional in that field? The second thing I want you to think about is, uh, how might somebody communicate ethically in that field? Right? So, um, some people were talking about like mentorship and sports medicine, and some of the challenges about not disclosing personal medical information. That would be one example. And then lastly, um, how might you engage with, for instance, respond to or deal with microaggressions that could come up in that area as well? So again, uh, you, you don't have to pick the career for the rest of your life today, um, but think about you know, an area that's potentially interesting to you and uh, take some time on these questions, the stuff that we've been talking about so far. Ways that gendered or racial dynamics are at play in your field, right? So, uh, you know, what genders or races are more commonly associated with that field, and how might that deal with issues like microaggressions? And then, lastly, you know, what ethical communication might involve is providing openness, providing support, uh, being sort of aware of uh, some of those issues. So, it's fun to hear and see you all share some of the things that you're thinking about and you're interested in like education, health, uh, farming, and all sorts of other topics. 
So to wrap up for today, uh, we've talked about some of the changes, especially surrounding COVID-19, that we've noticed in the workplace. Um, and, you know, the very idea of a work as a place has changed a lot. Uh, for instance, right, we see folks like professional streamers or uh, folks that have exclusively online forms of communication. We talked about some of the challenges of ethics and some of the different leadership styles that we might see at play in the office too. So, uh, going into Wednesday uh, is Defense Against the Dark Arts. So we'll get into 499 to 507 and get into some of the negative patterns and challenges related to interpersonal communication. So if you haven't already emailed, uh, please pass forward your attendance for today. Please continue to work on your recording and reflection essay. Please complete the instructor evaluations if you haven't done so already. Uh, stay safe out there, enjoy the snow, and I will see you again soon. Thank you.